So we have Dr. Ijoma Akero, and I want to get this right. This is from the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, UT Health Houston, a very short name for an institution. And she will be talking to us about ICDs and all you need to know. Looking forward to it. <laughs> So I was being very, uh, I guess, facetious by saying all you need to know about ICDs in one hour is the primary point. Um, it's going to be probably about 40 minutes to allow for about 20 minutes of questions. If you guys have any, please feel free to put any information or any questions that you have in the chat so that we'd be able to um, answer any questions that you might have. Um, but basically, I wanted to talk about ICDs. We've been placing a lot of high voltage devices, and um, I wanted to take us back to the beginning of this a little bit, just to talk about how the ICD came about, why we do what we do, why we program the way that we do, and then also why we place them in the patients that we do. And so I hope that this um, lecture comes out um, to be advantageous or to be helpful for you moving into the future. Um, I don't really have any, um, any disclosures um, with regards to this talk. I wanted to talk to you um, over the course of this talk. I wanted to talk about the history of ICDs, um, guidelines and how we came about with the guidelines for placement of ICDs. And then I'll touch on a little bit about the inner workings of the ICD, what makes up the defibrillator, as well as sensing detection and programming um, for treatment of tachyarrhythmias. So, you know, this is the, when you look at the lifespan of defibrillators, it's actually not been that long. Um, since it actually got created or, um, you know, to the point where we are now, right? So, um, but the father of defibrillators is a physician named Mikhail Murawski. Um, he had a very interesting um, and fateful life. He was a victim of the Holocaust and actually escaped from Warsaw, um, Poland, where he was a prisoner. He and his family were prisoners of the Nazis. And um, by the time he came back after the war, he discovered that you know his family had passed away um, or his family had been killed. Um, one of the dying wishes of his grandfather before he escaped was that he enrolled in medical school. And so he ended up going to medical school first in Poland and then later on in France, moved to Israel for residency um, and went into private practice and met his mentor, Harry Heller, who um, you know, recommended that he go to um, get further um, training. Um, he actually trained with Helen Tossig, and I don't know if you guys know about her, but she was um, a great um, pediatric cardiologist. Um, one of the, if you've heard about the BT shunt, so the Blaylock Tossig shunt um, for um, congenital heart disease, she was um, one of the folks who basically came about um, or who came up with that procedure. Um, and so he trained with her and um, in Baltimore and ended up coming back to Israel to work with his mentor. Um, in 1967, um, you know, at that point in time, they were doing um, defibrillators, but um, external defibrillators for patients who had ventricular arrhythmias. They had discovered the relationship between ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death, but the only thing that was available for treatment was, were these external defibrillators. And so patients were limited to staying in the hospital um, throughout, you know, the, for the rest of their lives. And so Henry Heller was like, you know what, I don't want to do that. He did not want to be tied to the hospital. And he ended up dying from a ventricular arrest. So, um, you know, the idea was then, you know, for um, Dr. Murawski, he started thinking, well, what of if I could miniaturize the defibrillator and also make it such that it is inside of the body um, instead of outside so it could help people like my mentor who don't want to be tied to the hospital. And so he um, met up with um, Dr. Maori. Um, and both of them just started talking about, you know, what his thoughts were. And that's when he started his research. 
1969, they did their first crude test on a canine where they miniaturized the actual ICD and then put in um, the external pads on the inside and saw if it would work and it did. Um, but, you know, of course, from there to where we have the ICD took a really long time, about 10, 11 years. In between that time, he met, you know, an engineer and physician, um, Stephen Hellman, who helped him refine his ICD prototype. He was the, um, the um, he had a company called Medrad um, that soon became um, Medtronic. Um, but then um, in 1980, they were successful and they were able to create, you know, the first ICD where you had the first implant done at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And so this is an example of what the first ICD looked like. It was huge and very heavy. Um, it had to be um, placed abdominally with a thoracotomy that was needed for um, the leads to be placed on top of the heart. Um, in 1985, um, the FDA approved the ICD for human use. And now we consider it to be, you know, standard of care for you to have an ICD. But back then it was considered to be barbaric, you know, like why would you do this? Let people die in peace, et cetera, et cetera. And so there had to be a lot of clinical trials to actually prove efficacy um, before um, this actually became standard of care care. And even then that took an even longer time. So this is an example of what the um, defibrillator um, leads looked like. Um, they were very basic. They were just kind of shock boxes. If you saw, um, you know, VT, it was able to shock you out of it, but it wasn't able to pace. There was no ATP, you know, all these things that we take for granted now, there was nothing like that. Um, Indication for ICD use in 1985 was survival of two episodes of cardiac arrest. So it was very limited. Um, and then we had to do trials to kind of figure out, okay, who else would benefit from the placement of a defibrillator? So most people decided, or most physicians actually wanted to, um, actually wanted to have the patients be on antiarrhythmics rather than putting a defibrillator. And so, you know, the question was, well, who are the patients that would benefit more from an ICD than from putting antiarrhythmics, particularly since antiarrhythmics were not without their side effects as well. So um, 1988 um, came, um, brought about a transformative um, you know, um, advancement where you had these um, transvenous leads that were eventually approved. And basically this allowed for, you know, um, ATP or anti-tachycardia pacing, also allowed for bradycardia therapies to be combined with defibrillation therapies. And so it opened up the gamut of patients who could get the defibrillator. Um, and so between um, those two things, you know, we have kind of come to where we are now, where we had these huge defibrillators and then now they've become much smaller um, transvenous um, um, devices that we're able to use today. So um, the first trials that were done, you know, we had to first of all decide, okay, who would benefit from this? You know, not, we couldn't always um, say that the patients um, who would need to get defibrillators had to have survived, you know, two ventricular um, sudden cardiac death episodes. Because if that were the case, then, you know, first of all, that person would have to be around um, somebody who was able to give CPR or defibrillate. And, you know, a lot of patients died waiting for a defibrillator. And so there were three trials that were done that um, basically um, were the basis of guidelines today. So we have the first one, which was the um, AVID trial. Um, this was um, basically um, a thousand patients done in 1999, or at least published in 1999. So really, you know, pretty recently, right? Um, but it was, it took probably about five years all in all to um, take place. Um, ICD therapy was, um, you know, it was ICDs versus antiarrhythmic drugs. 
Um, and basically what they saw was that ICD therapy was associated with a 39, up to a 39% um, reduction in mortality at one year with 31% um, at three years um, when compared to antiarrhythmic drug therapy. Um, and most of the time those patients were on um, amiodarone. So, you know, while that was going on, you also had the Can Canadian implantable defibrillator um, study, which was also a randomized control trial of ICD versus amiodarone in this case. Um, this one did not reach statistical significance, as you can see. However, they did see a trend towards reduction in um, mortality. And the reason why this didn't um, reach significance was because actually the study was um, terminated terminated early because the AVID trial had already come out. So the SIDS trial came out in about 2000. AVID trial was about 1999. The CAS trial, that also was published in 2000. Um, this one, um, it was a cardiac arrest study in Hamburg, um, Germany, where it um, took about greater than 10 years to enroll patients. So even though it started before the AVID trial, um, it, you know, and it began in 1987, they didn't conclude for publication until 2000. So while that was happening, AVID had already come out. So I think they basically kind of were like, okay, this didn't also reach significance, but it was, there was a trend towards significance. And um, there was a 23% reduction in um, mortality um, when compared, when the ICD was compared to amiodarone and metoprolol. And um, what they also noticed in this trial, so this, the CAS trial actually um, gave us two um, things. First of all, well, first of all was the big thing, right? That there was a decrease in all-cause mortality. Um, the second thing was that um, the benefit of ICD therapy was seen um, during the first five years after the index event. I remember all of this was survivors of cardiac arrest. So this was for secondary prevention. Um, but the third thing um, that they um, talked about was um, because they were doing ICDs versus amiodarone or antiarrhythmics versus metoprolol. They actually had an arm for propafenone, and what they discovered was that there was an increased risk of death with propafenone versus, you know, any of the other arms. So they actually terminated that arm early. So when you see patients or when you see physicians say that, hey, um, class um, 1A um, antiarrhythmics should not be used in patients with um, structural heart disease, this is the trial that was the basis for that. So moving forward, you know, we've covered, you know, what happened with primary prevention. And so then secondary prevention, I'm sorry, we covered what happened with secondary prevention, but what about primary prevention? What about those patients who will, you know, not have a cardiac arrest or their cardiac arrest would be their presenting, um, you know, symptom and they would pass away before you even got to give them an ICD. Well, this is the reason why we started having these primary prevention trials. These are four of the trials that are pretty, um, laid the foundation for the recommendations for primary prevention use of ICDs. Um, first of all, we had the MADIT trial, which is a multi-center automatic defibrillator implantation trial. Um, which enrolled patients, you know, who'd had a previous MI, EF less than 35%. Um, some of them had non-sustained, they had to have either non-sustained ventricular tachycardia or positive signs on an EP study. Um, and they did amio versus um, an ICD, and they found that there was a 54% reduction that was clinically significant it was the results were a little bit controversial because in the ICD arm, they noticed that most of those patients had more beta blockade than in the antiarrhythmic arm. And so um, also they, um, so because of that, they said, okay, well, we're not going to use this to change guidelines as of yet, um, because they still had guidelines saying, hey, you should have for these patients who have MIs, you should be putting them on beta blockers. So the question was, well, was it the beta blocker that helped improve um, you know, um, mortality or was it the defibrillator? And so they waited until we had the MUST trial, which is the multi-center unsustained um, tachycardia trial. Um, 
that was later on published. It was basically EP guided therapy versus um, placebo, um, where you had patients with coronary disease, LVEF that was less than 40% this time, and non sustained VT or inducible VT at EP study. And the survival rate was the same thing, about 51%. So the combination of these two trials basically told them, hey, okay, great we should put primary prevention for ischemic heart disease as part of the um, guidelines. The made it 2 um, showed that um, was um, more towards patients who had an ejection fraction that was less than 30%, and they wanted to see you know, what the um, improvement in mortality would be. And in that case, um, they made sure that they made both arms a little bit more equal with beta blockade use and everything. And what they found was that there was still a reduction in mortality. It wasn't as impressive as the reduction seen in the MADIT trial, but it was still pretty impressive at about 31% with clinically significant um, results. And so with these three trials, we had inclusion in the guidelines. The SCUDHEV trial kind of changed the game because you know all the prior trials required you to have a prior MI or coronary artery disease, but the SCUDHEV trial did not. So it was patients with um, reduced heart failure, irrespective of ischemic heart disease or non-ischemic heart disease. Um, and um, SCUDHEV stands for the Sudden Cardiac Death and Heart Failure Trial. Um, that was published in 2005. Um, and basically, it was a multi-center trial looking at ICDs versus amio versus the um, placebo. And what they found was in patients with um, NYHA class 2 to 3, um, reduced ejection fraction, um, EF that was less than 35%, there was a 23% reduction in mortality when compared to placebo, um, but there was actually no difference between amiodarone and placebo. So with all these trials, you know, this basically set the tone um, for the treatment that we have today. And so this is just, you know, a little summary of you know, clinical trials that supported um, ICD therapy. Um, first, we had, you know, our secondary prevention trials, then we had our primary prevention trials, and then Companion was um, basically one that um, looked at CRTs, but we're not talking about that today. But with the primary prevention trials, um, we now have, you know, our guidelines for um, prevention of sudden cardiac death and basically for um, ICD use in these patients. Um, as you know, when we're talking about recommendations, um, you have the, you know, the basic way that we classify recommendations, where we look at, you know, the um, benefit versus risk, and then we look at levels of evidence as well. Um, if it's a class one indication, that means that the benefit far outweighs the risk, um, so it should be performed. If it's class three, that means it's harmful and should not be performed. And then if you, you have your 2A and 2B, 2A means it's reasonable, 2B means that, okay, it may be considered, but most of the time folks will treat a 2B like a 2A and basically um, place the patients um, on that recommendation anyway. So for patients with secondary prevention um, with ischemic heart disease, um, you can see here that um, it becomes kind of pretty, um, you know, apparent that an ICD is um, needed for most of the patients, right? So um, if you have a patient who has um, a sudden cardiac arrest and has ischemia that's warranting revascularization, um, you you should revascularize this patient, but the patient does not necessarily need to have an ICD, right? So this is a patient who, for those of us um, who have this available, you might talk about putting an external defibrillator on um, or like a wearable defibrillator. Um, but for a patient who does not have ischemia, then of course those patients need an ICD and they also need guideline-directed medical therapy. For a patient who has ischemic heart disease and cardiac syncope, EF is less than 
there's an ICD that's needed. If the EF is not less than 35%, then they recommend doing an EP study. And if you have inducible ventricular um, tachycardia, then you put in an ICD. If you don't, then extended monitoring is reasonable. And this is for patients who have secondary, for secondary prevention with patients who have ischemic heart disease. Um, for those who have ischemic heart disease, um, but we're talking about primary prevention now. So patients who have not had a cardiac arrest, their ejection fraction is less than 40%. This is basically the tree that they want you to follow, where if their MI was less than 40 days ago, or if they had revascularization less than 90 days ago, you know, if you're worried, let's say they had a wearable defibrillator and um, they had a shock, then you should put an ICD, um, if they had, you know, VT and you had an EP study that basically showed that they had inducible sustained ventricular tachycardia, then it is a class one for you to put an ICD in. But if they don't, then you should just do guideline directed medical therapy and then wait until, you know, you get to either greater than 40 days past an MI if you did not revascularize or greater than 90 days if you did revascularize. If you do revascularize, um, or if this is after 90 days or after 40 days post MI, if you did not revascularize, then you recheck an ejection fraction. And for patients who are class one, so no real symptoms of heart failure, but with an EF of less than 30%, they should get an ICD. If they have an EF that's less than or equal to 35%, then they should be NYHA class two or three. And then for them to get an ICD, for an EF that's less than 40% now, then they have to have either inducible VT on an EP study or an unsustained ventricular tachycardia, then they meet criteria for an ICD. And then if they're NYHA class four, but they are a candidate for advanced heart failure therapy, so if you're putting in an LVAD, if you're putting them on drips, if they're awaiting transplant, then you can put in an ICD in those patients, but an ICD should not be implanted in somebody who is not a candidate for advanced heart failure therapy, because that would be considered to be kind of cruel and unusual punishment. And so we don't want to have that done. Um, in 2013, there were these appropriate use criteria um, that were published for ICDs and CRT. One thing that's important is that if you have recurrent ventricular fibrillation or polymorphic VT um, in somebody who has an MI, um, most of them, you know, do recommend that maybe you might, it might be appropriate um, if the patient does not have revascularization needed or if patient has, um, you know, sites that can cause ischemia, but they're not amenable to revascularization. If the EF is greater than 35%, it could be, you know, justified. If it's less than 35, it's definitely re-justified. Um, however, if you have somebody who has ischemic heart disease and you did revascularize, then, and the ejection fraction is greater than 35%, then you really should not be putting in an ICD in those patients. Now, going to our patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, you know, the idea is, well, if they do have, um, if they, obviously, if they've had it for secondary prevention, then it's either a class one or a class two B, um, you know, recommendation um, is a class one indication, sorry, for them to get an ICD. If they have symptoms that are suggestive or worrisome for ventricular arrhythmias and they have an ejection fraction that's low, then you should be putting an ICD in them. If you don't know if it's because of a ventricular arrhythmia, then an EP study um, can be warranted. Um, if you have a patient with class two or three heart failure and with an ejection fraction that's less than 35%, then this person is an ICD candidate. The only time that they're not an ICD candidate would be if they have this, um, but it has been less than three months that they have been on guideline-directed medical therapy, or they're not on optimal guideline-directed medical therapy. So if you have a patient, for instance, who has a um, ejection fraction of less than 35%, but then you notice that their blood pressure is, you know, 170 over 100, 
then even though they might have been on an ACE and an ARB and you know all the good medications, obviously they're not an optimal medical therapy. And so what the plan should be is they should actually get um, their medications managed so that their blood pressure is better controlled. And then you start the clock again. So the clock really doesn't start until they're on optimal guideline directed medical therapy before you consider putting in a defibrillator. Now, this is a little bit controversial in patients who have a wide complex tachycardia, I'm sorry, a wide complex at baseline. So if they have a left bundle that's greater than 120 milliseconds, or if they have um, you know, a non-left bundle that's greater than 150 milliseconds, then the question is, well, does CRT or the need for CRT trump the need for optimal, you know, guideline directed medical therapy? And, you know, the question is we really don't know, right? Um, could you put in a, you know, CRTP instead? It's not standard of care at this point in time, um, but there are those that argue that, well, you know, a lot of patients who have con um, interventricular conduction delay are not really going to improve their ejection fraction, um, even though they need to be optimized on their medical therapy. But um, I think that more um, research needs to be done in this area. Now, um, with patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the um, if they are if it's for secondary prevention, of course, an ICD is recommended. Um, if they don't have a history of sudden cardiac death or syncope, then they have to have high risk features. So either a family history of sudden cardiac death, if they have um, you know a left ventricular. Um, septal width that's greater than 30 millimeters, or if they've had syncope less than six months ago, then you put in an ICD. Um, if not, then the other things that you should look at are the presence of non-sustained VT, abnormal blood pressure response to exercise. So if their blood pressure gets decreased um, while they're exercising, that's really abnormal. And then also, sometimes we're also looking at, you know, we do an MRI and we look at late gadolinium enhancement. Um, and if they have that, that can also be a modifier. So any of those three can basically say, hey, this person needs to have an ICD. If they don't have any of these, then an ICD is of no benefit and they should not get a defibrillator. So just the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy does not give you leave to put in an ICD. It really should be in consideration of all these um, risk factors. Patients with sarcoid, um, I'll leave you to read this on your own, but pretty much, you know, same thing applies if they've had a cardiac arrest. Obviously, that's secondary prevention. Please do it. If they have an ejection fraction that's less than 35%, please do it. Um, if they don't, then you have to have like extensive cars, syncope, or um, if they're um, a candidate for a permanent pacemaker, those patients have been considered um, to be an ICD candidate. And so they can get a defibrillator in that case. So um, neuromuscular dis disorders, I'm going to leave you to read this as well. Pretty much um, most um, neuro um, neuromuscular disorders um, if they have a, um, a meaningful survival of greater than one year, that's a class one. Um, there's certain ones that are class two, um, specifically Emory Dreyfus and limb girdle type 1B. Um, and then if um, they also need a permanent pacemaker, then an ICD um, might be considered as well. For the um, cardiac channelopathies, so we're talking about Brugada um, or CPVT, short QT, long QT. Um, if they have um, a first degree relative that has you know, a mutation that's specific, um, it might be recommended if they have sudden cardiac death. You should do genetic testing for sure, um, but the ICD typically is only if they have an increased risk, so you should look at their risk factors. So basically, an example is this, right? If you have somebody with suspected Bugatta syndrome, um, definitely do the genetic um, testing. If they have type 1 and they have a cardiac arrest, 
um, then they're an ICD candidate. If they don't have a history of a cardiac arrest or unexplained syncope, then you can do an EP study for risk stratification where you look to see if um, VT is inducible. If not, um, you can always observe without therapy and just kind of monitor. Um, if they are an ICD candidate, um, the question whether or not you do a catheter ablation or quinidine um, is really left up to the primary care of um, the primary cardiologist, but they definitely should be getting um, an ICD. Long QT, this is the um, look for that. Basically, obviously, if they've had resuscitated cardiac arrest, um, even if you put them on a beta blocker, an ICD is still a class one indication. If they haven't had a cardiac arrest, then looking at their QTC is important, where if they have a QTC that's less than 470 milliseconds, then you want to do a beta blocker um, and see if they have any other high risk features. And if they do, so high risk features, including like syncope, family history of sudden cardiac death, um, um, that would be something that you put an ICD in. Um, if not, then just a beta blocker should be fine and monitoring the patient as well. So really the idea is if you see somebody with long QT syndrome, you have to take a family history and then you have to also take their own history as well, make sure that they haven't had any syncope. Sometimes they don't remember that they had syncope and you know they um, put them on, um, put a beta blocker on um, and, um, you know, would just make sure that they haven't had syncope before um, you decide whether just to do a beta blocker or to put in an ICD, because that would be very important in these patients. So in summary, you have class one indication um, for an ICD placement in patients where it's for secondary prevention, if they have sustained VT with structural heart disease, if they have syncope and VT during an EP study, um, as well as you know, the other primary prevention um, um, recommendations. So NYHA two to three EF that's less than 35%, NYHA class one EF less than 30% or non-sustained VT post MI EF less than 40% and VT VF at EP study. For class 2A, it includes all of these. I just want you to kind of like, you know, pay attention to the fact that Brugada syndrome is only with syncope or VT, CPVT only with syncope. Um, if you have, um, you know, hypertroph hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or ARVD, it's only with major risk factors. So all these diagnoses, they are not an indication for ICD by themselves. They have to have modifiers to it. The only ones that would recommend that you place an ICD just with the diagnosis are sarcoid, giant cell myocarditis, and Chagas disease. Those are basically um, considered to be very um, and, um, arrhythmic um, conditions. And so those patients should get an ICD um, whether or not they've had um, syncope. For class 2B, um, this is basically um, what we talked about. LV non-compaction falls under class 2B um, and um, except if the patient has had syncope or if the patient has demonstrable um, ventricular arrhythmias. And then of course, class three, if you have a patient who has a suspected survival of less than one year from another cause, then you do not want to put it in a defibrillator. Um, if they have incessant VT or VF, then this is not a patient that you should put in an ICD in. Um, it's of course changed with us having um, more therapies that we can treat um, VT with, with um, ablation therapy, as well as um, non-invasive um, ablation with radiotherapy. Um, significant, if the patient has significant psychiatric illness, then this is not going to be a candidate for um, ICD just because we have seen very um, worrisome um, situations where a patient will not realize that they have a device that can shock them and that can cause them a lot of mental distress. Um, if you have VT or VF that's secondary to a reversible cause, then of course you shouldn't be putting an ICD in this patient. So that's where the um, patients with MIs fall under. Um, but we should also take note that sometimes if a patient has had an MI, and they also have scar, then the scar can be a uh, nidus 
for further VT. And so maybe those patients, if you see like non-sustained VT, you have a stress test that shows that the patient has scar, then maybe those patients should get an EP study for you to evaluate if this patient needs an ICD. So going back to the device, now that we've talked about, you know, guidelines, how we got here, the, um, you know, the trials that were done, um, let's look more at the device itself. So the ICD has specific functions, right? It's supposed to sense and it's supposed to either defibrillate or cardiovert. We really don't like to use it for cardioversion, except you're doing painless therapies like ATP. Um, you know, and then it should be able to, after doing all of that, detect sinus rhythm again. And so to this end, you know, I just wanted to familiarize you with the different parts of the defibrillator. Um, you have, of course, you know, your connector, your header. This is where your leads um, go into. You have this circuit board where you have your capacitors, your clock, your defibrillation protection. Um, and then, of course, you have the battery that sits at the bottom. Um, and this is what constitutes um, the defibrillator. This is another picture that basically shows the circuitry. And of course, all of that is cased in um, your, um, your cover that either has your favorite company, Medtronic or Abbott or, you know, Biotronic or Boston um, that, you know, but basically all of these devices, you know, on the inside, they pretty much look the same. Now, you know, apart from the device that is able to do all of this with all this information that we're able to give it. Um, we also have the lead. And the lead, you know, has been had a bad rap over the last few years where it's considered to be the weakest part of the circuit. But it does have a lot of very um, impressive engineering that's involved in the lead. And so, you know, the components of the ICD lead include, you know, conductors, insulation material, defibrillation coils, um, you know, the lead electrodes, somewhere that's able to pace, somewhere that's able to fixate. Um, usually for the ICD leads, um, I haven't ever seen a passive fixation ICD lead. I'm not sure if there's one available, but if there was, that was before my time. But we do have the screw, the active fixation screws. Um, there's a yoke sometimes. Um, this is really with just the DF1 leads um, where you have a separation of the pacing components to the, and the defibrillation components. Um, a DF4 lead, which kind of brings all of that together, does not have um, a yoke. Um, the yoke used to be considered to be a point of weakness in the lead. And so that's the reason why we have the DF4 leads now. Um, and then of course the lead connector um, which basically goes into the header. Um, the different devices what? or the different companies have their leads um, kind of placed differently. The reasons why they place it differently, I'm not really sure. Um, that is um, left towards engineers and you know people who are much smarter than me. But basically for all of them, they will say that their leads are the best, um, but you can tell that they have pretty much the same components. They'll have your high voltage coil, you'll have a pace sense coil, you have a compression lumen um, sometimes. So in Biotronic, they have that, and in Medtronic, they have it, not necessarily in Boston or um, Abbott slash St. Jude. Um, there's an outer um, insulation that sits on the outside of the um, Pensent pace and sense coil so that it's able to detect things um, with fidelity. And then also you have your inner insulation that kind of surrounds all the um, lead components. The other thing that I want to talk to you about is, you know, sometimes you'll hear us talking about, you know, integrative bipolar versus dedicated bipolar. A dedicated bipolar um, looks more like this, where you have an extra electrode at the tip and then you have basically your cathode going to your anode. Um, it's able to sense from your tip to a ring versus the integrated bipolar. It basically senses from the tip to the distal coil and um, it gives you a larger antenna. So it can be um, a good thing in that the engineering is not as, there's, there isn't an extra place for you to have like oversensing or breakage, but the um, disadvantage is that it's more liable to have oversensing because you have a larger antenna. Um, 
Um, and, you know, like I said, the dedicated bipolar needs an extra electrode for that to happen. Um, also, both leads, they can either be single coil or dual coil. So this is just an example of the lead um, electrical design where you could have, you know, your sensing or your pacing circuit is typically around, um, you know, your anode and your cathode um, around the tip of the lead. Um, either it's going to be smaller, something over here, if you have a dedicated bipolar, or if you have an integrated bipolar, your, um, you know, your sensing um, circuit is a little bit um, wider. Um, your shocking circuit is something that's totally different. It usually uses the coil, right? And um, the generator or the device or the cam. And so this explains why when we have our ICD leads and EGMs, what we're looking at is looking at, you know, your leadless EKG that basically looks at anywhere from the coil or the tip to the cam. So it basically gives you the largest antenna and it's, uh, um, it's basically simulates what a surface EKG is supposed to look like. Um, then you can see your far field shock, um, shock morphology. Um, and then you see near field, which is basically the tip to the ring or the tip to the um, distal um, coil for those that have integrated bipolar. And then you'll have your market channel. And your market channel pretty much says, hey, this is what the device is seeing. So the market channel, um, when you're interrogating a device, most of the time we want to see all of these components listed in your interrogation. Sometimes it's not... Um, you know, set at baseline for you to see all of them. And the reason why that's important is that even though you have the marker channel, remember that the marker channel is what the device interprets that it's seeing. And it's basically going to do whatever it does based off of what it sees. Now, what it sees may or may not be accurate and so that's the reason why you need to see the EGM. So if you have a dual chamber, you want to have you know, your atrial um, EGM and your near field sensing, um, as well as your ventricular EGM. And then you can either put your like, you know, EKG or your far field shock to be your far field so that you can kind of see what the surface EKG is going to look like. And that will, is going to be able to help you determine what it is that you're seeing um, when you look at a defibrillator and a defibrillator interrogation. Um, hey, yes. Sorry, Dr. Carroll, when you were talking about hardware, one thing um, to mention too is Azagus coils is also an option. So it gives you a, a more posterior vector and is a, is a different kind of hardware that you can add as well. True. So the Azagus coil, um, the reason it's, it's important to note though that the Azagus coil, for you to put that in, you also have to make sure that your defibrillator is a DF1. So you can't use an Azagos coil in a DF4 device. So just make sure that if you're going to do that, you know, that's basically what you do. Most of the time we don't do that anymore. It's not really, um, it's in rare cases we have. Typically the patients that will benefit from an Azagos coil are those who have a really large um, ventricle um, because you need to cover more of the LV um, and the azagos coil can help you do that. So um, that's something to um, consider when you're considering different um, leads to place. There is actually a uh, DF4 splitter as well that will allow you to add, um, if you do ever need to add an azagos coil. Obviously, this is a very specific use case, but mm -hmm. um, I've used it a lot in the past. I mean, the, in St. Louis, we had a lot of these really dilated hearts. So I think it's always, you know, viable, but it's not, your first line of defense, obviously, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, looking at um, programming for your VT and VF, right? So what we want is for tachycardia to be detected, um, the device to determine that the tachycardia is either SVT or VT. If it's VT, then do something about it. If it's SVT, then basically say, hey, it's SVT, I'm going to report it but I'm not going to give a painful therapy, right? So those are the things that we think about. Um, in considering 
what is being done and um, or what is available for SVT versus VT discrimination, it differs a little bit between a single chamber device and a dual chamber device. Um, presently, the guidelines that have been um, or the recommendations that we have are that if the patient doesn't have any pacing indication, then you should put in a single lead ICD. And that's because the trials that were done, but that were done earlier on, um, pretty much did not allow for, or th there was no, um, there was no change in mortality or change in um, therapy given when you compared uh, um, atrial, um, a device that had an atrial lead to one that did not. Um, so the discriminators are the same apart from the atrial sensing algorithm and that's present in a dual chamber device. So typically what you're looking at here is you look at onset, which basically is able to determine, um, hey, is this a sinus tachycardia, which has a slow onset, or is this a tachycardia, which is usually abrupt, right? So you look at that. Then you look at stability. In patients who have ventricular tachycardia, which most of the time is either not on, um, automatic focus or it can be circuit-based, usually they're stable RR intervals with a change of probably about 20, 15 to 20% between cycle lengths. Um, and so typically if it's pretty stable, then it reads it as, okay, this is probably, this might be ventricular tachycardia or it still might be SVT, but what it is not is a fib or atrial flutter, right? And a fib atrial flutter, the device will say, hey, I'm not going to shock that because the patient is probably stable. But if it considers that to be VT, then it'll want to shock. And then the other thing that it'll look at is morphology. And the morphology really does depend on the template that you take. And so certain things can change your template. Um, for example, if you have like a rate-related aberrancy, if you have SVT, but there's a rate-related aberrancy, that can change your template and can cause you to have an inappropriate shock. Um, sometimes you have like problems with your amplifier settings and that we can discuss later. Um, also, you can have changes in the morphology over time. And that's the reason why a lot of times we have to update the template just to make sure when you're doing your interrogation, just to make sure that um, it's able to distinguish SVT versus VT um, at those times. For um, those who have an atrial lead, um, then their further atrial um, arrhythmia things that we look at, right? So we look to see, hey, if you have Vs greater than As or As greater than Vs, um, if it's you have a V greater than A, then that's a VT. If you have V equal to A, then it could be an SVT. And then if you have, you know, an As, As greater than Vs, then it could be, you know, um, atrial attack cardia. So those are the things that it's able to look at. Now, of course, if you have, um, during times of um, an atrial arrhythmia, there are some times that you have a change in your, um, your sensing. So for instance, at, in sinus rhythm, your atrial sensing could be as high as 2.5, right? But then when the patient goes into atrial fibrillation, or maybe goes into atrial flutter and one of the P waves is hidden in the QRS and it's in a blanking period, then it's not going to track it or it doesn't see it, then it might read that it's V's greater than A's and put it into the wrong bucket. So that really, that's another reason why, you know, just having the market channels is not sufficient. You should also have the EGM that goes with it just to see if there's an explanation for what the device is seeing. Because sometimes it's pretty apparent, you look at the EKG, you know that this patient has an atrial arrhythmia, but the patient still got shocked. So if that happens, then you want to be able to reprogram. And um, that's how you'd be able to do it by a good interrogation, knowing what is supposed to happen, and then being able to program around it. Now, another thing that I wanted to touch base on, you know, really quickly, is how we go about choosing our zones. Um, the Made It RIT trial was actually really um, integral in determining how we um, program zones these days. Um, so it was called the Reduction in Inappropriate Therapy and Mortality Through ICD Programming, um, published in 2012. And basically what they did is they had three different arms. They had a first arm, which was conventional, 
had two zones, a VT and a VF zone, and you basically had your nominal settings out the box, pretty short detection settings, um, and a certain number of rate cutoffs. So zone one in this particular case was 170 milliseconds. Zone two was 200 mil, um, beats per minute, sorry, not milliseconds, beats per minute. Um, then you had a high rate arm, right? Where you did not give therapy unless the rate went above 200 beats a minute, but you had a monitor zone. So you had a VT zone that was a monitor zone where you kind of looked at it and to just see if the patient had VT at a lower rate. Um, and then there was a duration delay arm where you had VT in all zones, but they delayed the duration of detection. So here, instead of the detection being 12 seconds, it was pushed out to 60 seconds. And then in your VT2 zone or your zone two zone, which was 200 beats a minute, that's when it went back to 12 seconds. Um, you had an ATP and a shock. And then um, in your zone three, they actually programmed a VF zone, which was greater than 250 milliseconds. And that one was um, 250 beats a minute. Um, you had your zone duration be at 2.5 seconds and you shocked after that. So what they found, um, oh, and then in addition to that, they also um, had different arms for ATP, where in certain cases they would, um, you know, program a lot more ATP, um, or they would increment or change their programming a little bit, um, and you can see more in the paper. I do want to, for those of us who don't really know what ATP stands for, it's called anti-tachycardia pacing. And the idea is that if you're able to pace the patient a little bit faster than their, than their ventricular rate and they're in VT, you can suppress the ventricular tachycardia and actually cause them to go back into sinus rhythm. So it's considered to be a painless tachycardia therapy where you're just kind of pacing the patient out of it. Um, the different ways you can do it, you can do a burst where it's basically the same um, cycle length. So you take the cycle length of the ventricular tachycardia and take a percentage of that. So, you know, let's say um, you take the cycle length and then you'll program it and say, okay, we're going to program it to be 88% of the cycle length of the VT. Then the device puts that in and says, so in this example, the 88% was 300 milliseconds, and then it starts pacing at that. And then so here, it now it will pace at a certain number of pulses. I usually program eight, some people go up to 10. Um, depending on the ventricular tachycardia, if it's really slow, I program um, the ATV to be longer because it takes longer to get into the circuit. Um, but once you do that, you once you finish your pulse, then you wait a little bit to see if there's a redetection and then you can try that multiple times. I typically program five bursts or you know whatever, five cycles. There's some people that just go down to three. Some people just do one and then do a shock. It really depends on what the patient has or what it is that you're seeing because you want to optimize the amount of painless therapy that they get before they actually get shocked while you're also reducing the chance that they're going to go into VF because you're playing around with um, bursts, right? So the ramp actually does it the opposite way, it or not the opposite way, but in a different way, where within the actual um, cycle, it will um, go down and decrement in the um, cycle length. So for instance, here in the burst, it actually went 300 milliseconds um, at each time, right? In this one in ramp, it'll go 300, then 292, then 284, and it will continue to go down for the number of um, pulses that you want to give. Um, and so you can do like a burst, you can do a ramp, you can do a scan, you can do, and a scan just basically slowly increases the number. Um, and the idea is that while you're doing that, you're hoping that you're able to convert. And then if you don't convert after a period, then the device will say, okay, we've done this enough, we're going to shock now. And so, you know, while it's doing all of that, um, the um, it basically will take a look to see it will charge. And then it will look again to see if the patient is still in VT and if the patient is still in VT, then it will shock. If it looks again and the patient is no longer in VT, then it actually lets everything go. And so what they found that was that by increasing, you know, 
or delaying therapy, and also with increasing the higher weight therapy, their um, number of inappropriate shocks actually was greatly decreased with our programming of B and C um, rather than conventional therapy. And actually there was a decrease in mortality noted as well that was most pronounced in the patients who had high rate therapy. So for those patients where um, you had a, uh, um, you had it set at detection at 170, but just with a monitor zone and then treatment, not until it was 200, they actually had less probability of death. And so with that, they made recommendations of, hey, if you have somebody who is being shocked for um, sign, um, primary prevention, maybe just two zones is sufficient. You don't have to put a third zone in the middle. Um, if it is for secondary prevention, or you know this patient has VT, then you can always make changes um, as a result. So these were the programming considerations that they said to consider, where if the patient has a history of VT, then you can do a multi-zone device with um, the, race, um, the base rate cutoff being you know, a little bit higher than you would um, expect, or the VT rate minus 10, um, and then you activate at ATP VF zone, still high at 240 beats per minute. Um, but if the patient does not have a history of VT, then maybe you should do a single zone device where you will have a monitor zone and then you'll have a VF zone with the rate cutoff being 250 minus the patient age. Um, it doesn't always follow though, um, because typically I will, if the patient does not have a history of VT, then I will go probably about 220 or 200. I typically won't go, let's say if you have an 80 year old, I'm not going to do like a, a you know, v, VF zone that's at 188, um, just because you expect it to be really fast um, if the patient is going into VF. Um, you can also, if you want to decrease your, um, your um, shock or inappropriate shocks, you can also um, increase the number needed to detect or the time window um, and give the device a chance to differentiate whether it's sinus tac, if it may flutter, or if it's um, SVT, um, or if it's a non-sustained VT, because there are some times that when you increase the um, detection window, then the VT will actually resolve on its own and you don't have to have a shock. So you're still able to record it, but the patient did not have the worsened shock as a result. And the idea is that you have to balance these two things um, so that you can give the patient um, adequate therapy um, so that they, you know, while you are helping to resolve their issue and, you know, reduce mortality, you're also not causing them to have significant morbidity as a result of them um, having a, an arrhythmia that you didn't treat. And um, this is where I decided to end for now. We are at 12.08, so I'm able to answer any questions. Perfect. I, that was fantastic. I think you uh, you covered a lot there, and I think it was a lot we can uh, we can take from it. Do we have any questions from the group at all? We'll go ahead and leave this open. If you'd like to speak, we can uh, allow you to talk, or you can just reach out in the chat. I did have a case study, too, I wanted to just show people that maybe we can discuss uh, at the yeah. next lecture as well, once we allow time for questioning. Hi, Jamie. It's Jared here. Great talk. Um, I was just wondering in your practice with patients with um, already having an implantable ICD in situ and they've got a substrate, maybe the scar on the MRI, um, mm -hmm. what's your threshold for taking them to the cath lab if you would find that they're actually having shocks with VT? Are you, oh, are you in position? Low. Very low. Very low. So, good, good. I mean, these these days, so it's there's definitely been a change, right? So from when I started, um, it was definitely a lot 
more like people were a lot more resistant to go to VT um, ablations where we were waiting until the last minute. But just like with AFib ablation, right? With VT ablation, if you wait until like, you know, the patient is almost at death's door, then it becomes a little bit um, problematic and it, it actually becomes unsafe for the patient, right? Um, but now what we realize is that if we get in there earlier and studies have shown that if you get in there earlier, you actually help the patient um, better. So if a patient has a shock and I can tell, hey, this person has a scar, um, doing a VT ablation is um, pretty early in my book. That's fantastic. Good. Uh, Jared, were you also talking about going to the cath lab as well or just for the EP VT ablation? Uh, just for the VT ablation. I mean, there's because mm. you do see a lot of patients that you see in clinic who have, you know, sustained monomorphic VT that mm. probably have a, an ICD for uh, some form of cardiomyopathy. And usually if there's a substrate um, like SCAR, um, then it's usually could, could be quite an easily mappable, uh, you know, uh, curable as well uh, to stop these patients getting shocks. Yeah, thanks, Jared. That's, yeah. Yeah. Dr. thank you very much for the great discussion. Thank you. Yeah, I have some few questions. One, okay. yeah, is on the issue of MI and ICD. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you look at the guidelines as of 2018, it tells you that weeks for about 40 days uh, post MI, but under what condition will an ICD be planted instead of waiting for 40 days uh, post MI? That is one. Uh, then two uh, is on the issue of uh, subcut uh, subcutaneous ICD. Um, what are the specific indication in the current guidelines and uh, under uh, what condition do we usually implant that? Because I know uh, currently in uh, in Nigeria we have not we have not gone into subcut ICD. Um, the ones I've seen uh, in my local practice here in Port Harcourt, they are implanted in the US and uh, they return home, and it's usually uh, busting. So how many companies usually operate that subcutaneous ICD? Because all the ones I've seen, they are Boston uh, scientific. Then the third question is on the uh, on the issue, still the same subcutaneous. Uh, there are people that says that subcutaneous cannot terminate uh, vent a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. What is your experience on that? I know they cannot pace. But for the adjustment for um, for defibrillation, so mm -hmm. I want you to throw more light on that. Then the next thing is on the issue because when you plan this ICD for the patient, uh -huh. uh, the African or the Nigerian man, what is interested in is what bother him. Mm -hmm. What usually bother them is that doctor, when can I drive? These are the issues that bother them. Mm -hmm. So in your own practice, because what we use here in uh, Nigeria, we don't have our own specific guideline, but we use the UK guideline because that is what is close to us. Mm -hmm. So in the US, what is your regulation of when they can drive? Then to when, uh, they also ask you, when can I have sex with my wife? Mm -hmm. Th these are questions you must answer. You can't run away from them. Then also the last question is end of life an ICD, you know, where you practice, the cultural environment affects it, whether we like it or not. So what, what do you have to say about end of life and ICDs? Thank you, ma'am. Okay, thank you, Dr. Duffer. So I'll start with yeah. the first question. So you asked about ICDs post MI, when do you decide to put in an ICD prior to the 40 days? So for the, um, 40 days, remember the 40 days is if the patient did not get revascularized. So if they got totally revascularized is actually three months or 90 days after. So yeah, all right. And then so, but if they're not revascularized, so if let's say they come to you, they've already had, you know, 
Q waves everywhere. There's nothing really that you can do. And you didn't put in a stent. Then for those patients, you know, you're supposed to wait 40 days. Okay. Mm -hmm. Who are the patients that I would put in if they had, um, uh, if they have, if let's say I'm monitoring them and they, I see non-sustained VT or something that's worrisome for them actually going into VT, then, I mean, for us here, we can do an EP study. So I would do an EP study, but if you don't have, um, you know, the, uh, the ability to do an EP study, you know, just doing monitoring the patient and seeing that the patient is going into non-sustained VT does meet criteria as long as the patient is optimally controlled. So if you have already given the patient their beta blocker, given them all the medications you would have given them, the aspirin, the Pavix, all the things, control their blood pressure, and they still have non-sustained VT, then you know that would be an indication for you to put in a defibrillator. Or if they had syncope, you know, basically all the things that would make you a little bit worried, that would be a reason for you to put in an ICD in those patients. Um, with regards to the second question was with regards to the subcutaneous ICD. Yes, it's only Boston yeah. as of right now. Medtronic just got approved for an extravascular ICD, which is something a little bit different. Instead of the lead being on top of the sternum is actually below the sternum. And so the can is much, the generator is much smaller, but it's still in the same position. And it allows for pacing for the Medtronic one, but the Medtronic one is not widely used yet. I think it's just started being used in this first quarter, at least, um, or unless if you were involved in the clinical trial. Um, and I don't know if in Europe they're using the uh, Medtronic device yet. Um, for, but the one that's widely used is the subcutaneous ICD. The patients that I typically will put a subcutaneous ICD in, at least as of now, are young patients, patients who I worry that, hey, vascular access, I don't want to have an issue. So renal patients, patients who are, I'm putting it in for primary prevention. So if it's somebody who's it for secondary prevention, then I'll just close my eyes and do like a transvenous. But if it's for primary prevention, then it's more likely that I'm not even going to program ATP. And it's more likely that I'm going to do something more like a shock box in which case putting in a sub ICD would probably be best. Um, remember that for ICDs, you do have a weight limit for the arms. And so for the older patients, you know, the weight limit doesn't really matter. But for somebody who's pretty young, let's say somebody who has hokum and they're 30 or 28, then you telling them, oh, especially what I found is with, you know, young guys who want to exercise or who want to lift weights or who their job requires them to lift weights um, or lift something heavy, um, the 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 thought that the ICD lead could actually fracture as a result of those repetitive movements is an issue. And also remember, when you're so young, you have longer of your life to live, right? So that is a longer time for the lead to get damaged. Um, so the only time that I make um, I've made a, um, a a a difference in that approach was for a young guy who was like in his 20s, but he was really, really skinny. And so since he's really small, you know, putting in the device, the device on the side was like really big and, you know, it just, it just wouldn't have worked. And so, um, you know, I didn't put one in, I instead put a transvenous one, but otherwise he's doing okay. Um, and I think that was it for the subcutaneous ICD. Um, then, um, the driving issue. So I typically will tell patients after four weeks, they can fully drive a lot of times, depending on what their job is, maybe after two weeks, they can drive really the limitation to driving is the raising the arm above shoulder level. If it's transvenous and also pain medication. So if they're on pain medication, obviously they shouldn't, um, two weeks later, they can questionably drive, but definitely four weeks, two weeks, I'm like, depending on what their job is, um, because there's certain movements that you make that you don't realize like you're moving your shoulder, but you are. And then you also have to think about the worst case scenario, right? So if something happens when you're on the road and you feel like you have to do something with your arm and you raise it above your shoulder, could that cause an issue? It's less of an issue after two weeks, but definitely before two weeks, that would be a no. So I tell folks, hey, you shouldn't, um, you know, you shouldn't drive prior to two weeks. 
Um, with regards to sex, it really depends on why you got the device in the first place, right? So if you got it after an MI, then it's a little bit more complicated. And if you got it because of heart failure, then it's really, okay, what, how are you with the heart failure? That's what's going to limit, you know, whether or not you're able to engage in sexual activity or not. So if you're not able to climb up a flight of stairs, or if you are not able to, you know, walk predictably like more than a block or more than, you know, maybe from the front of your house to the back of your house, then sexual activity will be a little bit too much. Um, and then it also really depends on what kind of ventricular tachycardia you're having. So if you have an ICD and it's for primary prevention, then usually sexual activity really depends on NYHA class. If it's because of secondary prevention, then we have to optimize all those other things before we can say, oh, okay, you know, you can't have sex. If it's scar mediated, then I would do something like a treadmill stress test to kind of see, hey, with all the medications we give you, we're giving you a beta blocker. We're giving you sometimes an antiarrhythmic. Let's see what happens when you have PVCs or when you walk or when you exert yourself. And that will determine what happens, you know, when you have engaged in sexual activity, because the issue is there's nothing so traumatic than somebody who gets an ICD shock while they're engaged in sexual activity, they'll never want to have sex again. And so you definitely want to optimize their treatment first before you do anything like that. Um, and then end of life, were you talking about end of life of the patient or end of life of the device? No, end of life of the patient. Oh, okay, so end of life of the patient, it really is a discussion with the patient. So if the patient says, you know what, I am 95 years old, and I've had this device and sometimes it's shocked me, but it's there. And I feel like, you know, it's going to be soon my time to go. I don't want to have the defibrillator anymore. Then you can turn off the defibrillator. So that, that part is, you know, a discussion with the patient. Because at the, at the end of the day, the device has limited efficacy, right? So if let's say somebody sure. is actively dying, right? And the patient has, let's say renal disease, and you know they have multi-organ failure and they're dying. Yes, they'll go into VT and then it becomes cruel to leave the ICD on because it will shock them and shock them multiple times, but eventually it'll stop shocking them or eventually the shock is not going to work, right? Um, and so that's kind of where we are. Now, if this patient has like really bad heart failure, a lot of times it's not even the sudden cardiac death that will kill them. There's sometimes that it's actual pump failure that will kill them. And so in that yeah. situation, turning off the defibrillator is not really, it's a moot point. It doesn't really, um, you know, do anything. But if it's somebody who's just like, you know what, I've gotten shocked a couple of times and I'm tired, um, then you just turn it off. Okay. Good. Don't, so my, don't forget there also you have magnet as an option. So if you have patients that live rurally or don't have, you know, accessibility to get reprogrammed, you can always place a magnet over the ICD to disable tachytherapy. So you wouldn't want to use a strong, ideally one of those donut medical magnets, and that can at least be a bridge until you program it off or until they pass along. Okay. So the the this young group of people. This young group of people who are footballers and who get a sudden cardiac arrest in the pitch, what do you think that they usually give to them? Is it a subcut ICD or a transvenous ICD? Probably is a subcutaneous. Because then they don't have limitations in exercise. They don't have limitations in, you know, it's, it's usually a subcutaneous. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. and then I forgot to mention, I know that in Europe, um, Boston was trying out a um, leadless pacemaker sub-Q ICD combo. I don't know exactly where that trial went. I know that they started doing it sometime like a couple of years ago. Um, I don't know, okay. Jared, have you heard about that or am I speaking yeah. out of I've heard yeah. vague, vague, yeah. I've heard small things about it, but yeah, not 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 in depth that I could comment on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same here as well, Doctor Kuru. Yeah, I've yeah, heard of it. Okay, fine. What of those who have an ICD and they have shock while driving? Well, I mean, so that can happen. So if they have a shock, 
anytime I always tell patients, right? If you have an ICD shock, you should go and see your physician. Now, how quickly mm -hmm. you go and see your physician really depends on how many shocks you have. If you have one shock, then you can go see your physician within, call your physician and then go see them within the next day or so, next couple of days. If you have more than one shock in a 24 hour period, you should be heading towards the hospital immediately because you don't know if it's just going to be two shocks or if it's going to be 12 shocks within the next day, right? So if you're in VT storm, which is more than three shocks in a 24 hour period, by then you should be on drips, you should be doing all these sorts of things. Um, and really, you're not going to know what happened during the patient's driving until you interrogate the device. And unfortunately, since remote monitoring really isn't a thing in Nigeria at this point, um, you know, they really just need to get somewhere where um, they have a device, where they can get their device checked. Let's check. Thank you, Mark. Especially here, here in the UK, anyone that has a shock has a six-month ban on driving. Not sure what that's like in the US. It's only for commercial drivers. Oh, okay. Really? Where, because we, where, we use the where, UK where guideline in Nigeria yeah. too. Yeah. Well, they, I guess because the only people that you can really, you need medical clearance for driving is the commercial drivers. Like, so everybody else, I mean, we tell them not to drive, but a lot of people, it's, it's difficult to... Um, I know I haven't made a, there was somebody I threatened that I was going to write a letter to the Texas Department of Public Safety because he was trying not to get his ICD changed. And I was like, I'm going to write a letter. But it, it definitely, it's not, it's not really standard, but for the patients who, who have a commercial driver's license or who drive trucks and, you know, all of that, then that, yes, that they definitely have a six month ban. And then there were a couple of um, questions in the chat, like somebody, um, Dr. Um, Aquanolo, um, asked about um, what is the recommendation for patients with rheumatic heart disease and low EF, less than 30%. Really, honestly, right, the first thing that you're supposed to do when you see somebody with an ejection fraction that's low, the first thing that you're supposed to do is reverse, try to reverse their ejection fraction. So if you think it's due to rheumatic heart disease, then the answer is to treat whatever is causing it, whatever is causing the valvular issue that's causing, you know, um, cardiomyopathy, and then treat for three months. And then if after three months, EF has not gotten better, in spite of you treating, then the patient qualifies for an ICD. So the ICD is not the end all. The ICD is just more because those patients have an increased risk of, you know, cardiac arrest. And so that's the reason why you put it in. Um, the second one was, um, do the guidelines um, apply for subcutaneous ICD in patients with no indication for pacing. Um, so basically um, the sub, sub Q ICD indications are not different from single chamber ICD indications. So it's really the same thing. It's just patient selection, right? So anybody who reasonably you could put in a single chamber ICD, you can definitely put in a sub Q ICD. Um, if they have an indication for pacing, though, I would say, hey, you should probably put in a dual chamber ICD, um, then not, but um, the guidelines are not really specific for subcutaneous ICD. It's really more patient selection. If the patient has a history of like trans um, bloodborne diseases, if they are on dialysis, um, if they have really bad diabetes and you're worried that, you know, they could have an infection, then those patients should probably would do better getting a sub-Q ICD. Um, yeah. But I don't know if AJ we want to say something. No, uh, this is actually to a previous statement. Um, you know, when we were talking about uh, reprogramming or patients getting repeated shocks, um, I've had people reach out to me and say, oh, we're going to disable tachytherapy by putting a magnet over it. Uh, before they even had EKGs hooked up or had re had actually checked the device, I would highly recommend uh, interrogating the device or checking it with an EKG before disabling because it could very well be a valid shock. And if you take away this device's ability to treat, you could put the patient into a much worse situation unless that's what you're desiring is to let them pass on. So um, putting a magnet over it, you're blind. You don't really know what's happening without any kind of EKG or electrical check. Yeah, like I had two patients, right, in the space of two days. One patient was a device um, that had a, um, she was 
basically had been shocked, I think, 30 times over the past 24 hours. And um, you could tell that she was in a normal rhythm and it was just, but basically one of her leads had pulled back and it was actually, she had been programmed to think like 180 and her heart rate was 90. And, you know, so basically she got shocked because she was seeing both her A's and her V's in her ventricular lead. So that, you know, she was on telemetry, we could see it. And then we we're like, oh yeah, that's inappropriate. So we put, you know, the magnet on. And then after that, we, you know, shot, um, we programmed it. Another patient, 48 year old, they were like, oh yeah, we're going to put a magnet. I was like, oh, wait a little bit, it came down. And the patient was actually going into VF, but they could not believe that the patient was going to VF because it was so often. And so they were about to put a magnet on that patient would have died. So it's definitely important that before you put the magnet on, you know, unless in cases where you want to turn off tachytherapies because of other reasons, you do want to know what the arrhythmia is or what the device is seeing or is not seeing appropriately um, before you treat that. Absolutely. Perfect. Any just other questions? Point on, oh, yeah, I was just going to, sorry, man. I was just going to mention about the subcutaneous ICD again, Dr. Dappi. Um, everyone can have a subcutaneous ICD, but not everyone, uh, you know, endocardial ICD, sorry, but not everyone can have a subcutaneous ICD. You've got to pass a certain criteria. So, um, oh, yeah. yeah, so just make sure that if you are thinking about putting in a sub Q ICD, it's not for everyone. These patients need to have a, a, a prone and sitting up ECG and they have to meet certain criteria just to make sure that the T wave relative to the R wave is, um, is adequate. So just make sure you reach out to your respective Boston representatives if you are thinking about doing a sub Q. That's dead on. I forgot about the screening that they do for that. So. Well, um, any other comments from the group? If not, we'll hop into this quick EGM. Oh. Right, well, thank you, Dr. Caro. That was absolutely uh, fantastic, very enlightening. And I think we had a really great discussion afterwards. So I'm glad to see everyone engaged. This uh, EGM channel brought to us by our, our friends at Abbott uh, kind of goes over a specific case example. So I'm going to show you the questions. We're going to look at the EGM. And then uh, next week, we can actually discuss uh, the answers just to give you a little bit of time to think on it. So I'm going to show it to you here. It's going to be available on YouTube. And then I'll also post it to the larger group so you can review it on your own. So uh, things to consider when we're looking at the CGM is what rhythm the patient is in, what type of device is being used. Is this SVT or VT? So supraventricular or ventricular tachycardia. Was the shock appropriate? Yeah, was the shock successful at terminating the tachycardia? Why did the device switch from an SVT? to a VF diagnosis, what do the tip, tick marks mean on the marker channel and the letters above them, did the ATP capture, and what was the minimum morphology match score for the episode? So um, these are here for your review, and then we'll move on down. All right, so episode of VF, 214 beats a minute, ATP therapy was delivered, a 30 joule shock was delivered, a 36 joule shock was delivered, and a 36 joule shock was aborted. You have your charge information here, your impedance here. You have your original diagnosis of SVT, followed by your diagnosis of VF. Here's your ATP therapy details, what the birth cycle links were. Here's your um, SVT discriminators that were engaged. You have morphology, you have interval stability. And then your depth waveform information, depth was off. We used a 65% tilt. And finally, your SVT diagnosis criteria. So you have your VF episode. This was obviously, they had a number of episodes. This is 89 of 93. And I'm just going to scroll through this. And like I said, you can pause here on YouTube or I'll show you the actual uh, PDF in our WhatsApp group. You can see that there was ATP above me. There was a charge here. This star means the device was charging with a high voltage shock of 30 joules. And that's the end of the EGM that you have to review. So we'll go ahead and share the, uh, the answers later, but uh, interested to know what your findings are, feel free to reach out into the WhatsApp group if you have any, if you have an answer for me, and we look forward to a conversation. All right. Anything else you want to cover today while we're here?
Nope. I'm good. Looks like Dr. Oldemeji said, what about episodes of Shocks and Drive? Okay, we already covered that. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, I appreciate everyone's time this uh, afternoon and evening. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, Dr. Carroll, for uh, your enlightening uh, conversation. And we're excited for the next one. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Right. Bye-bye.